When justice fails to penalize wrongdoing, fate steps in. This tale is so astonishing that it's hard to accept it truly occurred. Brenda Sue Schaefer was born in April 1952 and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, where she encountered her first significant other, Van, during her initial year of high school. The pair quickly became deeply enamored with one another, their bond appearing incredibly tender and innocent initially. They were inseparable and eagerly anticipated their marriage to explore physical closeness. Immediately after graduating, Van proposed to Brenda, who accepted with enthusiasm and excitement. Yet despite their relationship's outward charm, not everything was as idyllic as it appeared. Brenda was constantly under her family's watchful eye, leading her to be quite naive, purely innocent, and insecure about herself. Moreover, she relied heavily on Van, her boyfriend, who was sociable, active, and notably controlling towards Brenda. He relished his role as the decision-maker in their relationship and appreciated that his girlfriend was gentle and submissive, significantly influencing nearly all her actions. The first major issue the couple encountered post-marriage was a stark sexual incompatibility. Brenda, always reserved and somewhat conventional, and the adventurous Van, who sought excitement and diversity in their intimate life. Brenda started questioning their compatibility and whether she could endure her husband's robust nature indefinitely. Raised in a strict Catholic household, divorce was never an option for her, as she was taught by the Catholic Church that married partners should remain together and address challenges jointly, no matter the circumstances. Meanwhile, Van secured a dispatcher position at the Louisville Police Department. Although the salary was modest, it didn't prevent him from indulging and spending liberally on non-essential items, leading to the second major issue, financial disputes and management. Brenda frequently criticized her husband's careless financial habits, adding tension to their union. Additionally, Van began to consume alcohol excessively and use numerous recreational drugs, amplifying Brenda's growing resentment towards him. Nonetheless, truly cherishing his wife and recognizing the dire direction of their relationship, he proposed they seek marital counseling to have a relationship expert address their problems. The duo sought help from a psychotherapist, yet this move made no significant difference in the dynamics between Van and Brenda. After three years together, it became painfully clear that their profound incompatibility was insurmountable, and no remedy seemed plausible. Despite Brenda's attempts at moderation, the fourth year was marred by constant toxic squabbles, pettiness, and mutual resentments. Happiness eluded both in their partnership. Brenda started to seriously consider divorce, even discussing it with her parents. Her mother was entirely in favor, whereas her father held a contrary view, arguing that Brenda wasn't putting enough effort into her marital happiness. He voiced his discontent, urging her to persevere and resolve their issues. Nevertheless, Brenda made a final attempt to salvage their marriage, but ultimately chose her own well-being, proceeding with the divorce. The stigma and discomfort of being a divorced woman paled in comparison to the dread of a joyless and toxic union for the rest of her life. Post-divorce, Brenda embraced her independence and singlehood, dedicating herself to her career. It was a while before she was ready to entertain the idea of dating again. However, during a casual visit to a local store, she encountered Jim Rush. Jim was strikingly handsome, full of charm and charisma. A dentist by profession, he showed a sincere interest in Brenda. Encouraged, Brenda decided to take a chance on him, a decision she found no cause to regret. Jim lavished her with presents, offered tenderness and affection, arranged romantic evenings, and conveyed his love for Brenda in myriad ways. In a grand gesture, Jim even leased a billboard near downtown Louisville to publicize his affection, proclaiming the billboard too small to encapsulate his love for her a move that deeply touched Brenda. The pair frequently journeyed to exotic islands, and occasionally they took holidays alongside Brenda's family. Every family member anticipated that, in time, they would marry. Yet, as was the case initially, not all aspects of their union were as idyllic as they appeared. Jim was revealed to be dependent on alcohol. 
Having endured a failed marriage previously, Brenda was cautious not to overlook warning signs. Her reservations about wedlock deeply troubled Jim, but evidently it wasn't sufficient to deter his drinking habits. After years of cohabitation, Jim penned a note to Brenda, voicing his disillusionment along with other trivial complaints concerning their partnership, proposing they part ways. Caught off guard by such a development, Brenda was devastated. Despite her reluctance to wed him, she loved him and clung to the hope that Jim would transform into the partner she yearned for. Nevertheless, he showed no inclination to alter his ways. Brenda and her closest confidant, Joyce, shared remarkably parallel romantic entanglements. Both ended relationships with their significant others and resolved to seek companions who were stable, seasoned, financially sound, and of a more advanced age for their next chapter. Joyce led the way by entering a relationship with a man who embodied their ideal. Aiming to aid Brenda in moving past Jim, she introduced her to an acquaintance of her new beau. This gentleman was none other than 48-year-old Melvin Ignatow. Melvin Henry Ignatow, a native of Pennsylvania, was born on March 26, 1938, and later relocated to Louisville for employment opportunities. At the time he met Brenda, he was 14 years her senior, a divorced father of three, yet he was financially stable and came highly recommended for his stellar personality by his friends. Joyce, eager to see her friend happy, arranged a double date that included Melvin, encouraging Brenda to simply meet him without any commitment. The group embarked on a maritime excursion, enjoying each other's company immensely. Brenda found herself connecting with Melvin so well that he asked her out for an additional date, this time for just the two of them. Their subsequent meetings only served to deepen their connection, with Melvin showcasing the empathetic, loving nature that Brenda found to be refreshingly genuine and unlike any of her previous relationships. His affluence, manifested in a luxurious home, a yacht, and a stylish sports car, were undeniably appealing. Brenda was less attracted to Melvin physically, but this seemed a minor trade-off given his other attributes. However, she was blissfully unaware of the complex challenges that would emerge later on. Throughout their two-year union, Melvin's behavior towards Brenda evolved into increasingly possessive and authoritarian, marked by an overprotectiveness that bordered on obsession. He displayed clear signs of possessiveness and narcissism, which did not sit well with Brenda's family, raising serious concerns about his conduct. His habit of incessantly calling Brenda at her workplace to monitor her interactions, especially criticizing her amiability with her colleagues and her superior, led to his unpopularity among her co-workers. When away on international business, Ignato meticulously scheduled their calls, often ignoring the local time in Louisville, resulting in multiple disruptive calls throughout the night. Yet this was merely a portion of the daily challenges Brenda endured. In their private life, Brenda felt a stark disconnect with Melvin, particularly regarding their sexual compatibility. She disclosed that Ignato was keen on exploring his sexual fantasies, which included bondage, sensory deprivation, and group activities, all of which Brenda found objectionable. Despite her initial firm refusals, Melvin's persistent coercion led her to reluctantly try to accommodate his desires on a few occasions. His insistence reached a point where he introduced pills, allegedly to enhance her libido without disclosing their nature. Reluctantly, Brenda agreed to take them, only to find herself losing consciousness later awakening in agony with no recollection of the events that transpired. The recurring episodes of blackout induced fear in Brenda, leaving her deeply concerned about the extent of her partner's willingness to exploit her vulnerability. Brenda confided her anxieties to a friend who recommended she terminate her relationship. Following this advice, Brenda reached out to her former boyfriend Jim, revealing her dissatisfaction with Ignato and detailing the horrific experiences she had suffered. Jim similarly encouraged her to leave him. On September 21, 1988, Brenda contacted Jim to announce that she had ended things with Melvin. She expressed the need to see him one last time to return some jewelry he had given her. Ignato, both upset and heartbroken over the separation, turned to his previous love, Marianne Shore, whom he had been involved with prior to Brenda. 
Their affair was marked by intense passion, yet the issue was Mary's unreciprocated love for Melvin and her desire to marry him. Nevertheless, Melvin regarded her merely as an outlet for his desires, lacking any emotional attachment or intentions of integrating her into his life on a permanent basis. Contrary to Brenda, Mary was consistently adventurous and eager to engage in whatever Melvin proposed. They sporadically continued their liaison, even during Melvin's time with Schaefer. Marianne preserved her intense affection for him, yearning for even minimal recognition. Aware of his involvement with another, due to Melvin's transparency, this knowledge led her to resent Brenda deeply. Driven by jealousy, Mary felt she stood no chance of reclaiming his affection as long as Brenda remained a contender. Merely three days following Brenda's breakup with Melvin, on September 24th, she vanished. Her automobile was discovered abandoned adjacent to the Interstate 64, with its right tires deflated and a window broken. Although the car radio was gone, the presence of bloodstains on the rear seat was particularly disturbing. Following Brenda's vanishing, her kin and friends, including Melvin, convened at her family home. Melvin, appearing more distraught than the others due to being the last known individual to have been with Brenda, drew suspicion and inquiries about their last encounters. He detailed the day Brenda returned the jewelry. She fetched him at around 3.30 p.m. They toured the city relishing their time together, visited the Oxmoor shopping mall, enjoyed a meal, and she left Ignatow at his mother's place close to 11.30 p.m., marking the last moment he saw or communicated with her. Subsequently, Melvin used his mother's vehicle to head to Skyline Chili for another meal, confirmed by the assistant manager who spotted Ignatow there alone around midnight. Questioned about not using his vehicle, Melvin cited mechanical issues. Despite arriving in that same car at Brenda's parents' place the next day, raising eyebrows. Additionally, Melvin professed that he and Brenda were happily advancing towards marriage, a claim contradicted by common knowledge. Authorities also suspected Ignato's role in Brenda's disappearance. Summoned to the precinct, he anticipated needing legal representation and brought along a lawyer friend to assist in the search. During the interrogations, Melvin attempted to steer the discussions inundating officers with his inquiries while casually addressing them by first names, as though they were acquaintances. As media coverage intensified around Brenda's case, spotlighting the turmoil within her relationship with Melvin and his status as the last person to see her, public and investigative suspicion towards him grew. Melvin found himself in a fervent bid to establish his innocence, with public scrutiny significantly disrupting his routine. He faced accusatory glances and judgments in places as mundane as the post office or supermarket, branded by many as a felon. The authorities found themselves at an impasse. With a prime suspect in sight, they lacked witnesses, a body, and concrete evidence to connect Ignatow to the crime. As months passed, Brenda's fate remained a mystery. Within the U.S. legal framework, a grand jury evaluates the evidence submitted by the prosecution to determine if there's enough basis for a charge. However, the absence of concrete evidence against Ignatow led the prosecutor to offer him an opportunity to testify in his own defense, hoping to clear his name. Despite his attorney's cautions against doing so, Melvin, exhausted by the cloud of suspicion, chose to testify, unintentionally providing the prosecution with valuable information. Ignato mentioned his former girlfriend, Mary Ann Shore, during his testimony, and he recounted having a chloroform-soaked towel by the bed, allegedly for allergy relief during the night. His discomfort became palpable when discussing the chloroform, puzzled by the prosecutor's insight into such private details of his life. Unbeknownst to him, Brenda had shared her concerns about the chloroform with her loved ones, fearing Melvin might use it on her as she slept. Seeking to sway the grand jury, Ignatow expressed suicidal thoughts, stating his despondence over Brenda's disappearance had robbed him of his will to live, with only his religious faith keeping him from self-harm. He lamented the emotional toll taken by media scrutiny and described feeling persecuted by the general public. The prosecutor found Melvin's account credible and compelling until he claimed his alibi on the night of Brenda's disappearance was his presence with Shore. 
This claim piqued the prosecution's curiosity, prompting them to summon Shore as a witness, leading the case in an unexpected and startling direction. Mary Ann Shore was ill-prepared for her courtroom appearance and showed visible signs of nervousness when questioned about her acquaintance with Brenda. Her attempt to respond resulted in a confused mix of statements, leading her to abruptly exit the courtroom in distress and tears. It took a while for her to regain composure and come back. Observing that Mary's conduct was exacerbating her situation, her attorney suggested a plea bargain to circumvent a protracted incarceration. Shore consented and unveiled the grim reality behind Brenda Schaefer's fate. Melvin Ignatow had meticulously orchestrated the scheme days prior to Brenda's vanishing. He shared with Mary a checklist of items necessary for restraining and tormenting Brenda. Shore consented to Ignatow carrying out his scheme at her residence. They even performed a test to check if screams were audible from outside by having Mary scream inside a room while Ignatow verified from the street. They also excavated a sizable pit in the backyard, meant for Schaefer's burial. The night Brenda drove him to Marianne Shore's home, Ignatow disrobed Schaefer, secured her to a glass coffee table, and savagely attacked her repeatedly. The agony persisted for hours, with Shore capturing the ordeal on camera. Ultimately, after subduing Schaefer with chloroform, they wrapped her body in rope, encased it in a trash bag, and interred it. This disclosure stunned all attendees. They had suspected Melvin of involvement in Brenda's disappearance, but were not ready for the macabre specifics. Following his arrest, Ignatow's bail was fixed at half a million dollars. Forensic experts excavated the makeshift burial site in Marianne Shore's backyard, finding Schaefer's remains exactly as Shore had depicted, confirming her account. Brenda had been buried in the moist soil for 16 months. The search for the photos that would corroborate Ignatow's guilt ensued, yet they remained elusive. The trial was relocated to Kenton County to mitigate juror prejudice. Even though Brenda's remains were discovered and Mary admitted her involvement, no direct physical proof linked Melvin to the act. Ignatow's legal team contended that his participation was purely conjectural, suggesting Mary might have acted independently, driven by envy towards Brenda. Mary's behavior in court was peculiar, marked by laughter and grimaces, diminishing the gravity of the trial. Her apparent lack of guilt led jurors to question her honesty, while Ignatow consistently refuted any complicity. After a brief two-hour deliberation, the jury acquitted Melvin of all accusations. Despite nine out of twelve jurors suspecting Ignatow performed the acts Marianne depicted, the lack of concrete evidence led to his discharge from custody on December 23, 1991. Distressed by the verdict, the presiding judge personally extended an apology to Brenda's kin, lamenting the judicial system's inadequacy. Financially drained by his defense, Melvin liquidated nearly all his assets to afford his legal expenses. Mary Ann, sentenced to five years, was granted early release after serving three due to commendable conduct. Nonetheless, her demise at 58 followed a series of health complications, marking a sorrowful conclusion to her life. In subsequent years, Ignatow's property's new proprietors unearthed a concealed cache within the floorboards during refurbishments, revealing Brenda's ornaments and rolls of undeveloped film depicting Melvin's maltreatment of her. Yet, legal constraints prevented his retrial for the identical offense, even with the emergence of this evidence. He faced perjury charges for his court lies about not murdering Brenda Schaefer. Upon confessing to his deceit, he received a minimum of eight years imprisonment. Despite expressing regret to the Schaefers and asserting Brenda's last moments were devoid of suffering, his appeals for sentence reduction were rejected. Confronted with an additional federal perjury charge, he incurred a further nine-year penalty. Melvin completed his sentence, obtaining release in December 2006. About two years later, on December 1, 2008, at the age of 70, a glass coffee table accident occurred at his residence, marking the end of his life almost two decades after Brenda Schaefer's death. But justice was restored. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.